We just got this is Gosling Road here. 636, so we got 24 minutes to get up there. On this ride, Paul and I left Northampton, rode into the woodlands. We picked up uh, Team RR, we headed out west, and the plan was to go into Magnolia, Nickel Sawmill Road. The group split up there. I mean, we lost quite a few guys that didn't want to go as fast as we were going. We went down 1486 once again, like last week. Nice pace. My goal was to keep the group together as much as possible. We filmed all the way till we got into Dobbins. And then we went through and took Spring Branch Road, taking 105 there, coming to the Great Lake, Grand Lake Estates to Konya Egypt Road. We did not film the last stretch of this, but I think you will love the clips that we got for you. We're kind of showing how you have to pay attention to the weakest riders in the group and try to help them along because we've all been there and we've all done that. We're on Gosling Road. Just want to show you these geniuses are built, making a new road with no accommodations for cyclists. You can see, this is gonna be two lanes in either direction. There's nothing special for us. That's and look at we, the wasted in space you in take the middle. The right lane, but they don't wanna invest in us. Cause that would make too much sense. So they've got the traffic rerouted so on this side right now. Other bridge they're building across the way there. It's gonna be like this one. Hopefully they'll put a shoulder on there. If they don't, we're going to take the right lane. They're making really quick progress too. It wouldn't cost that much more to just make the lane a I mean, little nice wider. Done. That's the bike lane right there, the hike and bike trail. Can't really go fast on it. Yeah, it's not for fast see what riding. Doing over there. So they better put a shoulder there. They're replicating a bridge like this on the other side, which will make it very nice. Let's use the road. Come on. All right. Right now we come back in the afternoon on the hike and bike trail. Most of the time we want to chat anyway. And the reason why it's nice to have a shoulder is not every time you get on the bike you want to go fast. So if you're just chilling, nobody wants to impede traffic. That's why it's nice to make the lane either wide enough for cyclists or have a shoulder. So when we're not on the rivet, we can ride there and just casually take our time and enjoy the sights. That's what it's about. When I'm using the road, I'm moving, at least at this 22, 23 miles an hour. But when I'm just chilling, 15, 16, I don't like to be on busy roads. I don't want to be in uh, a blockade to the other road users. Even though I have the right to be there, does not mean I should be a jerk about it. So we're warming up, we're a little behind schedule, uh, but we're trying to get there as quickly as we can. And that's why we're, we're riding 22, 23, and we're gonna keep this same kind of effort until we hook up with the guys. It's a good warm up, it's a solid warm up. We're not going full gas, but uh, you know, a lot of times, sometimes when I warm up, I like to just kind of ease into my morning. So I don't like to just get up and start going hard right away. So that's why we ride to the group ride. So by the time we get there, our engines kind of warmed up. And it's always good when you're doing grand fondos and stuff. Get there early enough so you can spin around a bit. Get your body ready. So we're on, this is called Goslin Road. It's a slight grade. I'm on a small chain here. I'm probably riding at 39, 16 or something like that. I use the small chain rear a lot because I have a good variety of gears with the 3953. You don't have a lot of replications throughout the ratio, so you have some nice ratios that you can use that you can't find without cross chaining on the large chain ring combination. So when I'm just chilling, a lot of times, even sometimes following somebody in the group, I'll put it on a 3914, which is like a 5319, you know. I don't always spend time in the big ring.
We're approaching Flint Ridge. Flint Ridge Drive is in the distance. The sun just came. It's like 6.45. I think we get uh, daylight around 6.15 or 6.25, something like that. It varies. The cool thing is, I believe Congress passed a bill that will lock in. No more time changes. I think we get one more. I think this winter we get another one, and then no more time changes after that. They're going to stick with daylight savings time throughout. I'm not sure if we get another change or not. I'll have to check. So this is after we've picked up the group. We're on 1488, going through the intersection, headed west. I'm rolling up to get on Scott's wheel up there. We started out with a bunch of guys. You will see the line. There's a lot of riders here. This is Harry. Harry's new. Harry just moved from Seattle a few weeks ago, maybe four or five weeks ago, if I remember correctly from our conversation. This is his first time riding with Team RR. He was introduced to the group by Scott through the Group Me app. That's Scott in front of me. Scott hasn't been really riding on his regular routine, so they're just going to warm up with us. And after a few kilometers, they will let us go when we get to Mount Magnolia. So basically, I pulled up a little uh, write-up on the daylight savings things I mentioned earlier. It says the U.S. Senate approved the Sunshine Protection Act in March 2022. That was this year. With the goal of making daylight savings time permanent starting in November 2023. Okay. So we're getting uh, another change of time this fall. And then next year, once we get back to daylight savings time, it will just stick like that. That's what it appears to be. Because usually they change the time in November, you know, after the winter solstice. So this will be one last change this winter and then daylight saving time will be the standard time. It makes sense. Just leave it like that. That's the kind of stuff I like to keep up with. It affects my life directly. You know, your kids going to catch the bus and sometimes when they change the time like that, it's still dark when they're going outside, you know. <laughs> so you kind of, sometimes you need to escort your kids depending on how young they are. So this is Harry from Seattle. Um, Mike Barrera just finished his pull. He's drifting to the back. I've said it before that um, for the kind of cycling we're doing with the group here, it's not a competitive ride per se, but you know, guys always want to stretch themselves when it comes to a hill or going around a corner. So you want people to have their fun. But the goal should be to keep the group together so you encourage riders to keep coming out. You know, we got to keep growing our groups instead of just riding people off your wheel. No one wants to not be able to keep up. So stronger riders should just do things a little differently, take longer pulls or whatever. And uh, if I'm feeling good and somebody does something like they accelerate or whatever and I want to go with them, fine, I'll go with them and enjoy that moment. And then you will see us regrouping. And then you can do that with your group too. But to always just attack 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 after a while you kind of want to pay attention to the weaker rider this is pedro he's drifting to the back i'm glad that he didn't stay up there very long pedro's been traveling he just got back from spain and you know he, they were up there partying you know siesta time whatever and so he's not in the best shape right now so he had a lot of problems on this ride when he was in Spain, they rode mountain bikes and stuff. But, you know, you, you visited, you're on vacation. I don't think he was training hard. 
And so he gets back and he's struggling. You'll see we did our best to keep him with us. So it, at this pace, we're doing 22, 23 miles an hour. If you wanted to ride it to where the 22, 23 miles an hour in this situation is easy for you, what you do is when you get to the front, take a slightly longer turn so you get a good workout or when you're at the back sit off the wheel sit in the wind you'll get a workout and you're still staying with the guys there are ways you can make the ride harder for you to where you get a workout even though you with slower riders I mean some riders will even put more stuff in their saddlebags you know that's what people used to do when I was competing just to hang with slower riders they bring their heavier bike or carry more stuff in their pockets and extra stuff like that just to make it more challenging for themselves that you can ride your heavier wheels heavier tires so if you're one of those that the group is kind of easy for you to keep up with find ways to challenge yourself without having to ride people off your wheel all the time and then another thing you could do is when people do make accelerations is you take longer poles when you're going harder that will tire you out a little more then you, you know so like right now i'm at the front i'm gonna sit there longer I, the pace went to 40k i did not lift the effort that much but i think the road level off a bit you'll see it will come back down because in a little bit this road will go up but my plan here is to pull for at least two minutes and just because i say two minutes i don't look at the clock I'm gonna sit up there and when I when I leave the front this guy is new I don't know his level and so what my goal is that when I leave the front I want to give him either a flat road or a slight downhill so he can transition to the front under less duress the roads going up here ninja grade per se I'm keeping the effort the same. So that's what you do. You're feeling good. You feel stronger with your group. Sit up there longer. They will appreciate it. Then other people can take shorter turns. I've talked about it before. In the team time trials, in the big races, the grand tours, the stronger riders would take longer turns because they needed four other guys to cross the line with them. So if they had dropped all their teammates, they would still lose time because you got to wait for number five to come across the line before your time is official. So think about it in that regard. You're riding for the weakest rider when you're trying to keep the group together. And then the weakest rider or the weaker riders should not try to do heroic stuff. Don't sit there and pull and then start struggling in hour two or whatever you will see i will later in the film i will note the time with an arrow that pedro started struggling because early in the ride yeah you might feel good but if you know you haven't been doing your usual routine you got to save it save it for later see how you feel wait till later in the ride because you want to finish strong nobody wants to crawl home so the road is still going up i think after this little rise I, i'll probably get off the front i'm doing my best to keep it as steady as possible as the road goes up that's randy behind paul here there i'm off the front so while when he turned the camera around I came off the front i came off the front we go right here it starts to go a little downhill you see that it says minus one so i wanted harry to get a nice transition to a flat area a slight downhill so he can find a rhythm for himself i'm drifting to the back and then in, a, in about maybe i guess less than a kilometer i realized oh the camera's up here let me come and get it and show you guys more of the group than have paul just sit behind harry here with the camera so yeah the group is very uh, uh big 
So I have to ride all the way back to the front. And in a little bit, you'll see my shadow show up when I come to get the, the camera. So I had to work harder. That's what I'm talking about. So I got to get my workout without messing up the rhythm of the group. So when you're feeling good, that's what you do. You know, just like the guys who carry bottles to their teammates. You know, you can do stuff for other people in your group. Harry's taking a good pull here. I think, yeah, this is where I get the camera. Okay, I came, look how long that group is. I came all the way from the back to get that camera. And then I'm just holding it to where you can see people coming through. I thought, oh, this would be more interesting than just having it sitting up there. I forgot to get it from Paul when I pulled off the front. Usually he hands it to me. You will see us do that throughout the rest of the ride. That's Mike, Mike Barrera from San Diego, California. I think Mike might be Belgian. That's Dan the man. He greets me. Hey, Dan. That's Mike S5, and then Scott would tell me he's the last rider. So I just slipped behind him. So the whole time I was there with that camera pointing back, I was looking down at the wheels to look for the last rider, to look for that gap. So Harry's done pulling. He's pulled up to the side there, and then I'm going to get behind Scott. Now, Harry does something here that is consistent with what I was talking about. I guess he was feeling good. He sits in the wind chatting with Scott. So if you're a stronger rider in the group, you can do what you're gonna see Harry do. That makes it harder for you. And Harry just moved here from Seattle. He's not used to our humidity. You saw him take a drink there. In a little bit, you will hear him tell me, I'm already down to one bottle. I hadn't even taken a drink. So at the break, I suggested to him that you need a drink before you get on the bike. Cause down here, the humidity kicks in. So you can make your bottles last. Cause right here, he's already almost out of I mean he's down to one bottle that's what he tells me in a little bit you'll hear him he's drinking more because he's not used to this weather down here the Pacific Northwest is different than the, the mugginess down here so this is something you could do if you're feeling great you can sit there and chat with your mates and you get a workout Mo does that often in some of the rides he'll sit out there or he, after he takes a long pull he'll sit in the wind sometimes Mo will go back and shepherd other riders that have fallen off back to the group. So there are ways you can make it more challenging for you without breaking up your group. So you see where Harry is. I was a little concerned because I, I don't know his level. This is my first time riding with him. I was watching to say in a little while you'll see me, you hear me tell him, get in there. He will ask me, are you guys filming? And I'll say, yeah, get in there or something like that. So I want him to save energy because uh, I know what's coming. The terrain gets more challenging. So if you're doing what Harry is doing here, you better be feeling good because right now he's strictly in the wind chatting with Scott. Well, Scott is in the draft. I think Paul Ilonga is done pulling. In a little bit, this is where Harry will ask me what are we filming and all that kind of stuff. You'll see. So Harry's slowing down because Paul is drifting to the back. Harry really needs to come in so Paul can continue coming back or backwards. He needs to get, he should have been over there. Said, right here, I think this is where he will tell me. First already. Yeah, he said, I've gotten, he said, I finished my first bottle. Then he asked me, are you filming? Yeah, get in there. So I said, yeah, we're filming, get in there. I'm, I'm telling him to get in the draft because this road's going up. And he'd been sitting up there and he doesn't look that comfortable you know i could he's actually working so yeah <laughs> now he's getting on scott's wheel yeah he didn't look super comfortable out there so he really needs to get in so i give paul the camera i had a good training week so i had very strong legs on this ride You know, stuff always interferes. You plan and then life happens. So every so often the plan goes accordingly and then, you know, you reap the benefit. And then sometimes you have to adjust the plan, you know. 
Sometimes I'll ride on a day when I didn't plan to ride if I think later in the week I may not get a chance to ride as much. I sneak in a ride here and there. So I basically ride when I can. I don't, I don't get too hard-nosed about it, but I try to ride frequently. I think, I think Harry is behind Paul here. Yeah, I think, I hope, hopefully he's in the line because he spent a lot of energy in the whole stretch I've been talking about. So but that's what you would do if you're stronger than the, 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 the group is, for you know, is allowing you to work. And you say, oh, I want to work harder. Then you do that. You sit in the wind, you chat, you roam the bunch, do whatever, sit off the back like Jerry does. Jerry Lutner, he'll sit off the back and then ride up when people make a move at the front, ride up to that breakaway group. So he gets his workout. Jerry does a lot of KOM stuff. So you can find ways to make it hard and still be able to ride with riders that are not as fit as you are. But you got to ride with your head. You can't wait for somebody and then take off like you forgot that you waited for somebody who's struggling. If you got somebody who's struggling, then you need to change the riding. You know, and so we see that all the time. We'll wait for people and then guys will take off so you will see on this ride that we helped out some riders at the end later in the ride Paul Ilunga stayed with one of the riders so what we're doing we're basically running shifts sometimes I would stay with a rider sometimes Mike Barrera would be there or he'll back off the pace we we're all shepherding people like we kept our eye on, 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 you know, on people it doesn't have to be just one particular rider that way if a group goes off the front and you want to go, you can go knowing that your mate will stay with the weaker riders and you guys will regroup. We're approaching Mount Magnolia and this is where after we climb this, we realize we've lost a third of the group at least, if, if not half. Right here, there's a gap that's going to open. I'm keeping my eye on these guys because I don't know, I'm, I'm on the shoulder here. That's a that's a that's an entry lane, and then I see the gap opening, so I'm gonna move left. Of course, I use my mirror to make sure nothing's coming in the main lane. I let Paul know we're going, and I have to do almost 500 watts to get up there because of the terrain. I back off a bit. I'm on their wheel, and then they're gonna. The pace will lift it as the grade goes up again. We're about 3% here. I think it's about three and a half. So when you ride, if your group does stuff like this and you want to be in the front, you got to simulate those efforts. So Pedro is in front of Mike S5 here. That's Dan the man on the right and black there. Somebody lifted the pace. And it backed off a little bit. So I know we're going straight like we did last week, but we're not going to take the exact same route. We're going to take Nickel Sawmill, which goes through downtown Magnolia, unlike last week where we took 1774. The route was introduced by Greg Schott, but when, they, when we got to this point, they turned and went north. letting Paul know we're going over. We're taking the main lane. We're headed west. So right here is where we had the split where some guys went to the right. I was not aware of it until later on when we realized the group had shrunk. So Scott, Dan the Man, uh, Greg Shot, Randy, they turned right over there. They're going north on 149. We're headed west. And since we came through here yesterday, my memory bank had stored that bump that shook my bottle. So I made sure I avoided that particular bump. <laughs> so my bottle did not move this week. <laughs> That's how you have to ride. When you know, you're familiar with the area, you know, you, you learn the obstacles, learn where they are and read the road saves your wheels
This is where the construction barrels were. So we're getting back in the lane. And we're moving at a good clip here. 25 miles an hour. 41 kilometers an hour. So 25 and a half miles an hour, about 26 now. So we're moving. This is a good clip. When you start getting in the mid-20s, you're working. Even on a flat road, it's an, it's an effort. That's like when you sit in on the wheels. We're coming up to that bridge, I believe where the lips they're never perfect i don't know who engineers these but they need to start focusing on making things smooth so you can see the groove, groove has shrunk we lost a bunch of guys back there this is where we have those bumps where this concrete bridge meets the asphalt road so i stayed close to the white line because to the right it was bumpier and you saw it was much smoother I'm adjusting the boa, the boa, uh, uh, I really like those boa straps on the shoe, the closures, because you can do them like a millimeter at a time. Because after you've ridden for a while, your feet might swell, and so it's nice to be able to go down a notch here, a notch there, and I really love to let my shoes disappear, so to speak. So I don't mind tweaking them. But if you notice, I'm tweaking them where the road's flat, we have enough of a momentum. There is no gap in front of me. So all while I'm coasting, I just reach down and it's just nice. You can do the same thing with your Velcro closures. Don't be shy to make sure your feet are comfortable. You don't want your feet to lose circulation. But if you're having hot spots and all of that, it has a lot to do with the placement of your cleats. That's a whole different, that's a fit issue. The road goes up here. So it says 3%. That's why somebody made a comment that hills hurt. I don't remember which famous cyclist it was. If you want to work out, you want to get in shape fast, ride hills. It uses the muscles in a different manner, and you, you work. You get stronger quickly than just riding the flats. It doesn't mean you should only ride hills. We have two guys named Chris. Um, I gotta get his last name. It was on the, the Strava. We have Chris Frischi and Chris Strait. I think that's Chris Strait that, that just drifted back. I'm using the road because this lane ends. I took it early, there were no cars there, so the cars can know we're, we're in the main lane, so they can move over if they come. I use the wind here to slow me down. I don't have to brake. I don't like touching my brakes in the pace line. I'm gonna stay on the road here because that is not a, a, an actual shoulder. I hate those white lines that you go over them, but by going there, then you gotta come back. So if there's a car, then you're out of the, the lane and then you need, the, you need to come back in the lane. So it's better in that situation to just stay where you saw me stay. Because I knew that as soon as we went under that overpass, the, the shoulder would disappear. So, so I didn't want to go to the shoulder and have to come back. It's better to just stay in that position, especially when it's busy so the cars know that you're on the road. Because once you leave the road, they're going to be coming by. Now we have a, a shoulder that is more permanent, although the size will vary, but it's going to be here for a while. Then you get on the shoulder. And it, it applies if you can see it happening in the distance. The earlier you position yourself, the better off you are and the more information you're giving to the other road users early that, hey, I'm riding here, this is where I am, this is my position. Instead of you having to dart into traffic of the roads ending. It's the same thing I do in my car. When they have a merge point where a lane is ending, as soon as I see the merge sign, 
the first available opportunity I'm taking the main lane in my car. In our city here, everybody wants to wait till the last minute to run out of road. You know what I'm talking about, where that that triangular point is, and then they're jamming in there. <laughs> Everybody's got a break dance. Why wait? Get in early so that the traffic is smoother. Don't wait till you're running out of road in your car or on your bike. Get in early. So, so everybody has enough information. You're telling them early enough what you're doing. We're coming into the area near downtown Magnolia, Texas, but we're not going to go through downtown like we did. We're not going to do 1774 on the eastern tip of downtown. We're going to go kind of southwest. That's why I'm telling Michael we're doing a left turn. So we're gonna take this, I think it's Buddy Riley Road, they call it. We're gonna turn left, it will take us to, to downtown the Nickel Sawmill. Right here is where we discover that the group has shrunk and that we lost the ride. The guy who put the route out there, he put a map that we've lost him. But I looked at the maps, I'm familiar with the area. We've been out here, I mean, I don't know all the exact turns, but I, by looking at the map, you get a general idea. We we're supposed to go further west than we ended up going, but you know, regardless, this is when he's telling us somebody broke off at the back. They, they all went north at 149. Sorry? They turned off. Did they? So they're talking about Greg, Scott, and the rest of the guys that turned after Mount Magnolia. Because this was Greg's route we're supposed to be doing. I'm going to tell Michael that we're going to have to sneak across. Because the light won't change for us. Because that light is not picking us up. So uh, Darren said, let's, let's sneak forward. There's a car behind us, uh, but he's not close enough to trigger this stuff. So we're going to turn. This is Buddy Riley Road. It's going to take us through downtown Magnolia. They've been doing a lot of improvement on the road, new pavement or whatever. And apparently the last time these guys came through, there was some gravel sections. You hear Mike S5 ask, are we going to go through the gravel? I'm not familiar with any gravel section. I haven't been out here since last when we last week when we went on 1774, which we didn't come this way. So he didn't want to do gravel again because I guess maybe a few weeks back or whenever they came through and the road was shaved the way it was all dirt. And so that's his reason for turning around. We will end up turning around when we get into downtown. Somebody say car back, so I move over to make it easy for the driver to see around us. And we let those guys know so they can make a better decision of when it's safe to pass. That's the whole point in doing the single file stuff. Um, a lot of times, sometimes these drivers, they come too close. And so if you're in a situation where the roads are very busy and it's not safe for them to pass you using a section of your lane, it's okay for you to position yourself, even as a solo rider, and take up more of the lane to where they got to pass you like they would a car. Especially in urban areas, you got to take that right lane because you got cars parked on the side of the road that might open their doors. Never pass a parked car close enough to where if they open that door, you it will impede you. Always assume the door is open. Give a parked car a lot of room when you ride in urban areas or areas that have parked cars. I do the same thing in my neighborhood. People park on the street, I never pass right by the door. If they were to open the door, I'd have enough room to not get hit by the door. That's the way you should pass them. And whenever possible, if there are two lanes, use the left lane to pass a parked car. You never know who's in there. And I always look in these parked cars to see if there's a driver there. Every time James goes to the front, he lifts the pace beyond what the group is normally doing. He doesn't know how to keep things steady. The problem with that is I'm hoping one day we can get it on film like the third hour. Well, usually it happens on like Sunday or whatever. Anyway, he'll do this stuff early in the ride. Then hour three, he's struggling. 
<laughs> and I've seen him get popped off the back after forcing the pace early in the ride. And it's the same thing. Early in the ride, you know, you got to save something for later. You got to really sip your energy. I've said that before. That's anything. Group ride, Grand Fondo, whatever you do on your own solo ride. You want to do a long ride? That's not the time to hammer. You want to get that training effect by doing the hours. This is what he's talking about, the gravel. That's fine. He, he asked me, are we not, are we, he said, we're not going to take the gravel road, are we? I told him, I don't know. I haven't been out here. You can see all the barrels. So they're doing a lot of work. This is downtown Magnolia. We're going through kind of the side road here. We're going to turn left. Yeah. Left turn. So I guess this is where Mike S5 decides to go back. He said, no gravel for me. I'm going back. Whoa, no. Apparently, you see right here the new pavement? This was gravel recently because they had scraped it up to pave it. That, there you go. So, so a week ago, it was all gravel. I think that's Chris saying that. This guy on the white bike. We have two Chris's in the group and a bunch of mics. <laughs> that's Chris number two here. I think that's Chris straight in the back and Chris Frischie up front, if I got that right. I'm looking at Strava. This is Nichols Sawmill Road, and it had gravel section too because they're, they're trying to fix it up. You'll see all the barrels or whatever. <laughs> that's Harry. <laughs> Harry says, I'm new here. And Mike, Mike Barrera in front of me here is also new, but he has put the effort in to learn the area. So he's learned the routes quickly. And of course, he was watching the film when he lived in San Diego. So he got some of our early you know, excursions that we were leaving town. But he's picked up on the routes. He likes the forest, so he heads out. He says it's God's country. He loves the trees, the forest, the deer, that kind of stuff. That's what it's about. Go outside and enjoy being out. I let Paul know if he's if 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 uh, what's his name James keeps speeding. He's asking me about a guy who put the route together. He said a guy who made who put the route together did he move? I'm trying to dodge a little crevice there that came up on me. I used my hips to get around it just to save my wheels. I'm going to ride up and explain to him the guy has a medical condition. Yeah, he's taking something. I think he had like a some high blood pressure problem or something he was taking that was suppressing his heart rate. And he was trying different medications over time to see which would not which one would not interfere with his ability to go hard on the bicycle when he's exercising and so until he gets that sore that he's doing a lot of long steady rides that's the kind of riding he's doing that's why i explained to mike greg that uh, his brother is uh also in the area that rides with us hey man greg and doug the brothers shot tell you something about my my guess he was debating if i should split with those guys i know i know yeah, uh, what, what Paul is what Paul is saying is that what, what Paul is saying he's telling me what what Mike S five said about the gravel road and stuff back there, and uh, whether he you know he's gonna ride on gravel or whatever. But what Paul was saying was that he thinks that Mike S five was debating earlier whether to turn with the guys that went on one forty nine, and I guess he changed his mind. So that's what we're talking about. So this is Nichols Sawmill Road, and in about a kilometer, I see the car coming. It's getting crowded. It's construction. You see where I am? I'm letting I'm letting the drivers know we're going to be okay. using the road. Yeah, everything is cool. I, I I'm I'm asking if everything's okay because someone yelled in the back, and I I looked back and it looked okay. I didn't see anybody have a problem, and I was asking Paul if everything was all right because when the wind's blowing, you can't hear verbal stuff very well. 
I'm kind of keeping my eye up. Two or three guys behind Paul. So right here, I'm letting the drivers know we're going to use the road. There are drivers behind us. They're patient. But I'm placing myself to where they won't pass. I didn't realize we were turning here. That was kind of late. That was a late, late notice. So, you know, we, we caught it. We came through okay. So we're off of Nickel Sawmill. This is like I call Hockley Road or something like that. This will take us. Now we're headed north. We're going west. Now we're going north. This will take us across 1488 yet again. But it will take us through like a zigzag. And we'll get back to FM 1774. Which is a little west of the area where Jackson Road is. And we're going to get on 1486 where all the rollers are. But right here in this stretch, it's nice and quiet. There's some twists and turns, you know, nothing drastic, but there's some good riding. I don't come out here very frequently because uh, it's mostly flat, you know. So it's like I much rather go in the forest, and and, I, and this road is quiet, but to get to it, Nickel Salt is a little hectic. So I move up in the pace line to get on Mike Barrera's wheel. These are all subdivisions. These are nice secondary roads, houses, farms, ranches. You know, people live here. There's no industry. So we're going through other people's neighborhoods. It's quieter. And because it's not heavily populated, you don't have a lot of intersections. Allows you to keep your effort up. You notice I'm always on one side or the other slightly of Mike's wheel. I want to see around. I want to see what's coming. That's how you plan your line. Eliminate surprises. The pavement's a little choppy. There are, there are no cars behind us. A quiet road. So I'm going to stay mostly towards the middle here because I saw a bunch of little cracks and crevices. I move back to the right. I'm going to come back over. Always looking for the smoothest pavement to use. I'm in a gear that I can rev from 75 to 100 and something. I don't have to do too much shifting because the terrain is flat. That Suki kit really works well with black. We had used it with our other team kit short, which was wine colored earlier in the year. It worked really well. So those of you who are not familiar with Suki, check out the description. There are details on how to get yourself some of that kit. Very inexpensive and high quality stuff at reasonable prices. This is 1488. We're going back across it. I like the way we came. I don't like riding 1488 when it gets very narrow. Because it gets very very narrow into Magnolia. I'm going to go to the front. They're slowing down too much. So I just want to keep us moving. James is off the front as usual. 
because for some reason he does not hold a consistent pace. And that wears the weaker rider. So I go to the front and I keep it steady, but steady enough to where I know we're going to catch him. I'm going to ride at 20 miles an hour. We're going into the wind somewhat. Wind's blowing, I believe, from the east, from our right. And this road is turning. So he's turned up the power. So he does a lot of short accelerations and this sits up. Uh, yeah, I don't get that. Even in a crit, you gotta go longer than that. So a lot of the guys have not been uh, coached in cycling, they never competed, they just ride. So they really watch TV and they see stuff. They don't really understand why the guys are doing what they see. That's another reason I explain what's going on in these films. They don't understand it, so they come out here and do it on a group ride, and they don't understand why it doesn't make sense to the riders who have competed and who have been coached. It's not logical. The guy's going to let us go. He's going to blink, and we just turn. This is like a three-way subdivision here. A nice road. So he blinked up. So Paul thanks him as we go by. And uh, Harry went around in that corner, and I believe I'm on, I'm, I'm in the third position. Harry's pulling. I think Chris is in front of me. You can see we're holding 21, 22, something like that. That's the way your group should ride. Instead of you having to stop and wait for somebody, keep it steady. If somebody else wants to play and they go faster, just keep the group steady. You guys will pull him or her back if they back off, if they can't maintain what they're doing. But it's better to keep that train rolling so you guys can cover some kilometers or miles we're doing 25 here because of the terrain the effort is not that much hard but this is this is the way your group should be you should just be moving steady she goes the turtle that's why the turtle beat the hair steady she goes so harry's done And I think I think that's Chris there, yeah. So Chris was one of the ones that was struggling in the the later part of the ride. We're gonna be turning right. There, there are gaps. I'm gonna. I'm going around him. I think we're coming to an intersection. Mike will see the gaps up there. He's gonna come to close it because we, we don't need any gaps. You gotta keep it tight. You guys heard on one field more was saying no gaps, no gaps at the end. It takes less energy to sit in there than than to close gaps. There is an intersection here. Oh, this is 1774. So we're going to go south. We're headed east right here. We're going to turn right on 1774. Now I'm going to let them know, ah, we didn't go far west enough. But it's okay. We'll go to Dacus or something like that. Just so we can make it up. Yeah. A circuitous route. Yeah, well, he kept saying more. Is, so yeah, that road keep further, going further west? Okay. But that's okay because you build. I don't know if he's route. We can take this and go to Dacus. Don't give us about the sink. So this is where Pedro puts his first request in. He probably didn't get it. He said, "Can we take it easy?" Mike, Mike says, "We're already taking it easy." And so Paul is laughing because we've all been there. Pedro's getting tired. You know, he said, why don't we take it easy? Mike Mike said, we're already taking it easy. <laughs> so Paul's laughing. So we turn here. I heard I heard the request. You know, 
I don't have a problem with it. I had a pretty hard training week anyway. But it's like, so I, I just go ahead and ride us into this area. But Pedro's getting tired. And he's like, why don't we take it easier, you know? And then later on the ride, he said, yeah, let's do 20. So after the first stop, we told him, you go set the pace and we'll just do your pace. But it's like, we can talk all we want, but it's almost like not everybody is paying attention to the conversation because people do different, they, they, don't, they ignore it. They just do whatever. And so you just, like I said earlier, you just want to keep your main group together. So you let people have their fun. I don't like to restrict people. This is a leisure activity. We're here to have a blast. So let people have their fun. And then you can, uh, as Michael said, you can make them burn some matches <laughs> when you come up to them. So don't make it easy for them to get into the line. When you catch them, lift the pace a little bit. Sometimes we do that. So they can burn another match as they get in. And they'll learn. Now let Paul come through. We we'll take the camera. This is simply we did the exchange last week. So, yeah. So what happened is because of how we were riding Mount Magnolia, some of the other guys are like, we don't want no part of this. They went a different route. So you can run people off when the pace is not what they want to do for three hours, and that's okay. If that's what you want to do, you do your pace. But then you try as much as possible to keep the core group together. So that's Harry. Harry's rolling through. I think, I don't know if somebody else is there. I guess I'm the last guy, yeah. So what I'm doing back here is I'm not gonna draft uh, meticulously. I'm gonna sit a little to the side. I'm on the shoulder. They're using a the road. It's quiet. That's fine. The shoulder is kind of narrow. Most of this stretch, we ended up using a road. Look at that line. Line is nice and tight. But I'm sitting back here to just kind of keep the effort up for me because if I get in a draft it gets a little easier this is a good size group so I ride back up I'm sitting on the shoulder still from time to time I will get on the road and get on the shoulder I was varying it based on the condition of the shoulder and how busy the road was uh, you know there's nothing wrong with where they are the cars can move over as they go by but a lot of times when we come through here, we use the shoulder. If it's just you, use the shoulder. The shoulders, it's wide enough for one bite. And especially, you know, we're in a line, our heads are down, we're not conversating or whatever. The drivers can see you guys working, they don't mind. But if you're out there goofing off, you know, stay on the shoulder, or, you know, find a quieter route. You know, if you're just chatting and chilling and don't go on busy roads and block people. Let them go about their business. And then if you're on a, on a ride, whether it's quiet or not, you're riding and a car is coming up behind you and your mate, close it up so they can get by, and then you guys just spread back out. I think that's cool. I think it's kind of inconsiderate to sit too abreast on a narrow road just because you have that right, doing 15 miles an hour. <laughs> it's like, let them go by. That's not why you left home. You left home to ride your bike. You didn't leave home to go block people or impede the flow of traffic. Think about it. If your car is having a problem and you're driving it to the shop, what would we do? We put the flashers on and stay in the right lane or sometimes even ride the shoulder because we don't want to block other people. If you do that in a car, why not on a bicycle? So learn to close it up, let people go by, and you know, if you're sitting out there, keep your eye behind you and know when cars are coming. That's what we do, we scoot over. The drivers appreciate it. We get a lot of friendly horns when we do that. They tap as they go by, they appreciate it. It's like mutual respect. I give my brother the camera and I roll. I'm glad that we do that because it's just more interesting so you guys can see what we're experiencing instead of just having the camera up front when he's pulling. So I cannot stress enough how hard I recuperate. You probably expected me to say how hard I train. No, I recuperate harder than I train. 
I hope that makes sense. Because resting is the other part of training. So resting is half of training. You work and then you rest. I rest hard. That's when your, your body really improves. So don't think that, oh, you rode great today. I got to go do more. <laughs> you better make sure you're getting enough rest. Make sure you're getting enough sleep. Uh, soaking in the tub, massaging, whatever it is you're into. Rest. Let those muscles build back up when you tear them down. But then when it's time to ride, you got to have specific training at the specific levels of effort. You can't do the same thing on every ride because then you would just be tired all the time. <laughs> so anyhow, that's what it takes. So when I say I had great legs, that's from resting. It's not just the work. Work and rest, that's the whole training package. After this ride, I took Sunday off. I had a big week. Did a lot of riding, a lot of resting. So Sunday, I just chilled. Went to the salon, got my feet pedicure done. You know, just scrub all the dead skin off of it. Felt good. Got to hang out with my significant other. <laughs> my better half. Whatever it is you call your old lady. My daughters call me an old man. I tell them, I'm Mr. Old Man to you. <laughs> you you want to call me an old man, you got to say it with respect. <laughs> Just messing with them. But yeah, it's fun. That's what it's all about. But I have to say that because you've got the rest. It doesn't mean sleep. Just take it easy. Put your feet up. Watch a game. I don't care. Whatever it is, you got to rest. You can tell by how you feel when you've recovered. You got to learn that. Nobody, nobody can tell you that. You've got to learn that. There's lots. Training is a science. There's a lot involved. And until you master that, you won't know how to dial in how you're going to feel for an event. There's a certain pattern everybody excels at. Like some riders like to do uh, uh, very hard. Then they drop down a little bit then they go easy and then take the day off they find a pattern that works for them to get them in peak condition i got on the shoulder there uh i don't i, I think there are, well it wasn't that busy i'm not sure what is the, the shoulder is nice and clean and uh, yeah, Chris is on the shoulder up front. I'm like, we really should be using the shoulder, but hey, if they're there, it's fine. If not, it's not busy today. This is a nice road. I just don't like solo riding my bike on 1488 like we did into Magnolia, because it's just the shoulder drops off and disappears like at the overpass of the Aggie Expressway, and it's like certain parts of it's kind of hectic. And it, they don't have big hills on 1488 once you pass Mount Magnolia. So I'm like, why do I need to deal with a lot of traffic just to ride a flat road? I can get that anywhere. <laughs> I'll deal with traffic to go get a nice 7 or 8% bump. So, you know. Somebody twisted the screw up there. We're working here. I'm pressing hard on the pedals. And this is where I'm getting my workout. So even though I'm not pulling, I'm sitting in the wind. And so I'm, I'm challenging myself. That's what you can do to so where you don't have to go to the front and break up the group. Work when you're back here. So both of us slip back behind Harry here. That was Mike. I think it was Mike at the front. I think he's pulled off now, yeah. Somebody else is pulling. Good job, Mike. So Paul tells him, good pull, good job. 
the road slightly up. Yes, yeah, that's one percent. You can just see it visually. When I'm riding my bike, I, this I feel this stuff. Because you're, you're on the road, you can't really see it ex except from a distance. But when you're riding, you can tell. You just feel it. We're coming to a uh, like a hill. It's a, a slight crest, so visibility is impaired. There's another cyclist going the other way. So when the drivers are coming to pass in this situation, they don't like to go way over because they don't want to get ahead on with some guy who's cresting the hill in the distance. And this is the reason why when I ride solo on a road like this, I will be on the shoulder because they can't use that whole lane safely because their sight is impaired. You kind of see the horizon in the distance. You can't see beyond that edge, if you know what I mean. So they try to stay, they straddle the yellow line, all that, you know. So when I'm on this road by myself, you'll see me on the shoulder. The speeds are too high to be messing around with these guys. But with a group like this, this is actually very safe. We, we're using the road. We're not going to be darting around back and forth off the shoulder because there are intersections where they, they've dropped a lot of debris, rocks for construction and whatever they're doing. Somebody lifted the pace again. You can see I'm putting power in the pedal. Look at the watts. 400 and something. And it just did it for a little while. Now it's dropped to 100. That's what I'm talking about. At the, you know, road racing, the reason they do that is they want to drop people. So unless you want to drop people in your group, riding like that is nuts. And the reason why WCC rides like that is they're preparing for road cycling competition. And yeah, James is the one who did it for five seconds. Now he's sitting in traffic. So what ends up happening now in a situation where we're riding aggressively, this is when you would attack him for that effort so he can burn another match to get back in. You lift the pace here. <laughs> <laughs> he goes to the front, lifts the pace. When he pulls up, you lift the pace if you got the legs. You don't have to say anything. He'll get the message. Mike Barrera was telling me a story. He said uh, when he started cycling in San Diego, he was in a race with uh, like the Pro 1, 2, 3, which is the fastest groups. And... He was sitting in the pace line, everything was nice, and something made him go out into the wind to go to the front. He said when that wind hit him, his effort level went up. And after a short while, everybody started passing him, and they were laughing because they had done it before, and they knew. And so he said he gets to the back of the group, and he's like at his limit, and he's working, trying not to get dropped. And there's one old guy sitting on the back, and he looks, be Michael looks behind and sees the guy. And the guy said, I'm the gatekeeper. I'm here to make sure nobody gets dropped. He said that statement from the guy gave him a slice of adrenaline and he got back in the line. Sometimes that's all it takes is a little push, a kind word, a word of encouragement. That's all you need because it starts in the mind first. You quit in the head first. You give up. And then the body quits, you know. So that's why in road racing, they'll stretch the elastic with these attacks back and forth. They want to see whether you believe you can do this forever. So unless you've been training like that, it wears you down. You just get tired. You're like, enough of this. I don't want to deal with it. We had a guy named Robert LaPlante. One day we are riding out. I told Paul the story. We are coming down uh, McCaleb Road South. All of a sudden, it got hard. And Robert was like, who did that? <laughs> and then Darren told him, it's uh, it's Mike that did that. And Mike did it again. Robert said, oh, I, I, I want to deal with it. So it was a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, we, and we ended up dropping. That's uh, Chris. I think it's Chris Strait. His last, he's going to go and lift the page. He does what James does. So these guys are like, we're not following him. And I'm just sitting in watching. I don't think he's that far up ahead. But that's what breaks up the group. He's got a gap on those guys. Well, it's changed the pace. Pedro's already struggling. Pedro had already asked, can we slow things down a little? So he's sitting there. They're riding up to him. I guess he backed up a little. But if you're going to go up there and lift the pace for just 10 seconds, that's not going to drop anybody. So I don't understand what 
when I see what I see on these rides, you're not dropping anybody with a 10 second effort like that in this situation. You got to make it longer and harder. I know they add up. Every little surge adds up, but if all you're going to do is 10 seconds, please. Yeah, that's not enough to do anything. So I don't know what, what he was doing. Maybe he was just going to the front to take a pull. It could be anything, but it's hard to figure out what some of the riders do in these rides. I don't say a whole lot. I like to speak with my legs. You do something, that's what Mike Barrera did. It's off camera, but Chris made the same move, same guy we, we had stopped at the store. Then he takes off. After we had been discussing that, this guy in front of me in the black, Pedro is tired, you know, but Pedro, go set the pace so we can hold your pace. He, Pedro goes, he sets the pace. So that Pedro pulls off, Chris takes off like he didn't hear anything we had been talking about. <laughs> so we let him sit out there. But when we got up to him, Mike lifted the pace. Because when you do that, he'd already slowed down. Well, if we come by and we lift the pace, you got to burn another match. You got to raise your pace to get in the line. You do that a few times, they learn real quickly. The road goes up here. Now, uh, Harry's sitting on the right and he's spinning very high cadence. But he's in the wind. And so I was thinking, hmm, why is he there? So I figured maybe he knows what he's doing. But I was watching him. In a, in a few kilometers, he will slip to the back because he's expending a lot more energy than we are. So unless you really want to be there, you know, if you're feeling really good, you're feeling really strong, and you want to be there, you, you, you need to get in some shelter. And I'm just watching him. I want to see if he wants... I had been behind him leaving a gap, but he never filled it. So then once it started going harder, I closed the gap. This is where we just passed him. And this is like a downhill. What is that? Minus two? Yeah. He's got to take a breather because he's been working so hard out there. That's that's the, the rocks that we avoided last week. So we're on the road. It's quiet. I'm, I got my eye on the traffic behind in my mirror. So I love the mirror because when I'm riding solo, I can decide when I want to use the main lane. When it's not busy, you can see you don't have to turn around. So I end up using more of the road down since I installed the mirror. You know, it's been a while now, but it just gives me more peace of mind. I know what's happening around me. So Harry's behind Paul somewhere back there. He had to go into shelter. You can only do that so long unless you're really feeling good, you know. So if those of you stronger riders in your group, you do what, what you saw Harry doing in this situation, sit in the wind. That way the whole ride, you're working hard so you can get your workout. Because if you, the bigger the bunch, if you sit in the bunch, you're not working that hard. It's an easy ride. That doesn't get you strong. So you sit in a bunch, you save it till you want to go hard. That's why that's what riders do in competition. But on a training ride, like the group rides, the training workout for me, for us. So it's like if you come in to get a workout, I want to work as hard as possible without getting dropped. That's my goal, where possible, you know. So uh, Chris pulls off and. Pedro takes over now this is where I believe Pedro needs this is what he needs to work on and people like Pedro don't pull you already told us can you take it easy why are you there when Chris pulled off Pedro should have pulled off and got back in the line because he's going slower I can feel it look at my heart rate it continues to drop So he's expending energy here that he could save to stay with the group. We ended up waiting for, you'll see, in the upcoming parts of the film. So he's working very hard punching a hole in the wind when he could use that energy to last. Now he pulled up. He shouldn't have taken that pull. He should have just gotten off the front as soon as uh, Chris got off. So now, at this part, we're on Spring Branch Road. This is after the break. We're coming back in town. This is a little over two and a half hours into the ride. 
We've already waited for Pedro at the corner. Yeah, man. Because he's he's struggling. I'm worried about the black arm sleeve, but it works fine. Yeah, man. I was on the fence about it too, man. I was like, man, I'm gonna just try it. If it's too hot, I'll put it in the pocket. <laughs> what we're talking yeah. about are the, are the arm sleeves that we wear. They come in multiple colors. The uh, the links in the, in the video for those of you who don't have a copy. They're the only ones in my entire cycling career that I've been able to wear above 75 degrees Fahrenheit in warm weather. I mean, 100 degrees is just nice and they do evaporative cooling. So the more you perspire, the cooler they get. If you want to wet them before the ride, you can. I don't. But they're the only, they work. And they're a third of the cost of the branded ones. So go figure. They're like $12 or something like that. And the other guys are selling there, so like 25, 30 bucks, $40. And I can't wear them for 30 seconds. Then they call them summer sleeves as well. These are not arm warmers that will keep you warm in the winter. These are arm warmers that give you uh, SPF 50 or U, now they do UPF 50, whatever it's called anyway. It shields you from the sun, but those things breathe so well. I've got a few copies in different colors and I just love them. Any ride longer than two hours, I put them on, especially if I'm going to be out in the sun. My short early rides, I don't bother because I'm just doing like 90 minutes or something. It's early in the morning, I don't bother. But all these rides where we're going to be four or five hours out there, I put them on. They work. And everyone's been asking about them on the ride, so I'm always putting the link on our group meet for them to get themselves copies because they just work. You see how the black shorts work with our Suki jersey? So, yeah. Uh, Suki has been very good to us, so we are trying to do some promotions to where you guys can get reasonably priced products. Use our Velo Harmony code, you get additional discount. Use the word Velo Harmony. Suki Sports. The link's in the description. We're, we're riding down here now. The goal was, okay, we're going to stay together. You know, Pedro's struggling. We, we, we stopped at the corner. I rode back to get him. And now he's in the bunch up there sitting. But his own buddy will be the one lifting the pace that will cause him to get dropped. Because <laughs> James is his buddy. They're tight. James, Robert, you know, that's that little click. Every group has their clicks. Little pieces of, uh, look like particle board on the road. Pieces of wood somebody dropped. If you look at my profile on my bicycle, you see how much lower I'm sitting than Chris up there. Chris is sitting too high. It's not about you being flexible. What it's about is that a lot of riders think that sitting upright is easy on the back. Try picking up something heavy upright. You, know what, you will pull your back. I'll figure out that these Suki jerseys, I fold them in the front, in inward, to prevent the mark on the shorts, man. Paul is talking about a Suki jersey. He believes that the yeah, zipper, the zipper may be putting a mark on the shorts. So he said that he folds it down a little bit. So I just went ahead and folded mine. I looked at the zipper after the ride. Yeah, it it, it is zipper. plastic, but sometimes you know you're riding, and if the jersey's down in that crevice in your abdomen area, it rubs. So what I told him, I said, now you know why Assos make their jersey short. Assos and Rafa. That's a dog in that yard. I always mess with them. There are three dogs. They always race in the yard there. So I was, I was greeting him. So I folded it up. Because what it does, it puts the fabric under the zipper. Because the zipper will rub your shorts, even though it's plastic on some jerseys. And you know, Paul's always keeping up with stuff. Trying to figure out, okay, where's this mark coming from? These shorts are not cheap. So when we get them, we want to squeeze every dollar of use out of it. I don't want to buy anything that's not necessary. So when I buy something, I take my time. I get the best quality stuff for the money. And I want to get my money's worth. I work them. I wear these shorts. I don't let them sit. I wash small loads throughout the week because they smell if they sit too long and it's just not good for the garments. 
The pace is picking up here. There are people going off the front. Well, I was talking about Pedro's buddy James has attacked. So Harry, you see Harry in the distance? Harry's riding up to James. Chris is going to join them in a little bit. But but uh, what's his name? Pedro is in front of Darren, and Pedro is going to be struggling. I'm keeping my eye on everything. Mike Barrera, I believe, is... I don't know if he's pulling now. He's up there. I move over so this driver can see the kind of go. He's going to go by. He's taking the other lane. This, the guys on this road, um, they're pretty, pretty laid back. The, the, the way drivers behave on the road has a lot to do with attitude. It's not just towards cyclists. It's towards other drivers. It's an attitude thing. Some, some of them just have a bad attitude, but not most people do. But it's the ones you remember that do stupid stuff or crazy stuff. You end up remembering that. Don't let that ruin your ride. Misery loves company. Don't let them ruin your ride. Give them plenty of, give them a wide berth. And let them go on by their, their business with their craziness. If you have to get off the road, get off the road. Let them go. You didn't come out there to, you don't own the road. They think they do. Let them go. Let them live in that delusion. So you see the gaps up there? I'm going to push Pedro here because he's struggling big time. I'm going to give him a good shove. And sometimes that's all you need. I've been there. I've been pushed. Do you see the grade? It's going to be between 1% and 2%. We're almost three hours into the ride. He's been struggling since 90 minutes into the ride. And then that little pull he put back there on the highway, he could have used that energy here. That's the point I'm pointing out. He's got to learn that. I don't, we don't want to leave anybody out here. So I'm watching. I don't want Darren pulling either because Darren is still not in top shape. Those of you who watched the film last week, Darren was struggling. So the gap's up there to those guys. I'm going to go in front of Darren and give him my wheel. Just block the wind for him. I think Mike Barrera is behind Paul. He's here with us, I believe. Yeah. So we're going to ride. The guys are not that far. You know, when, when James makes those moves, it, it's not sustainable because two reasons. He can't go hard very long, or he hasn't been preparing himself to do that. Secondly, they don't ride together when they're up front there because James doesn't place himself properly to give those guys a draft. We'll be on a road where the wind's coming from the right and James will be sitting next to the yellow line. Well, he should be by the white line so we can echelon. He, he doesn't do that. I don't know if he doesn't know that or whatever. So those are the kind of things to where that the group behind us working together has the advantage. That's Mike. So Mike's sitting in right now. Mike is aware of what's going on and what we're trying to do. Because we had talked about it earlier in the film. I had written up to him and I told him, when James does that, let's just keep it steady because I want to keep the group together. I'm going just hard enough to where these guys are going to be able to sit in, but we're not going to be too far behind the leaders up there because I know the leaders are going to turn off the power, and you'll see it develop over the next five kilometers, about three miles, you will see it. I'm keeping it steady so these guys can get a rhythm. We're going to be going downhill in a little bit. This is the 9% climb the other way that's coming. And we dropped to like 33, 34 miles an hour, something like that. 50 something kilometers an hour without even doing anything. There you go. 53K, 54, 55. So 34 miles an hour, I shift up, get a gear that I can feel, keep my legs moving. So we're doing about 27 miles an hour, let's say. So Paul tells Mike he got it, meaning the gap. All Mike is doing is keeping an eye on the front. He wants to keep this group within reach of those guys. That's what I believe he's thinking because in a little bit, he's going to come to the front. Before I'm ready to pull off, 
he comes to the front because I, I start to slow down because I don't want to raise the pace and these guys will struggle right here. You see Michael coming up? He feels, he feels me slowing down, but I'm doing that on purpose to keep it around 18 or so. So these guys, because this road is a, is a grade right here, 2%. So they come around and I see them. I say, okay, so then I just spin up the gear I'm in. I don't shift. I'm already in the gear I need to be in. You see my cadence just go up. I just rev up. I fill the gap. I get in the echelon. The wind's blowing from the right and in our face. Well, mostly from the right, from the south, this time of year. If you look at the sun in the sky there, our hottest month i believe is behind us the, the earth is tilting right there's a gap so I'm, I'm gonna go fill the gap because darren is leaving a gap he's struggling so i got on michael's wheel because once michael gets into that position he puts it in the gear he gets into the rhythm and he for him it's easy but it taxes the people behind him so you will see us start to pull away i'm gonna have to tell him to slow down don't tell him oh, you're losing him you'll see it develop but what i was talking about the sun was the, the Earth's axis tilts early summer towards the sun, so we get hotter in this hemisphere. This guy, Pedro, is struggling. Paul's going to tell him, get on my wheel. I'm going to tell Michael to back off. Right about there. There. That's why he pulled to the left. I can see, you know, we're losing people. I tell you, you're losing them. So he backed off. He's going to let me set the pace. And then Darren and them are coming closer and closer. So, Pedro's on Paul's wheel here. Pedro is on Paul's wheel. I'm watching my mirror, and as soon as everybody's together, I go ahead and just edge it just a bit. So we keep, we keep the guys in front, and I think Michael is gonna get in front of Paul here. Yeah, okay. And then uh, Paul told Pedro to get around here and get in. So now Paul's gonna be the gatekeeper here. So at this point here, you got a gatekeeper behind. If these guys were here and they would do something, I could go with them because we got other people staying with the, with the rider. You'll see that develop. The guys are always testing, you know, let's push the pace, uh, stretch the elastic. They see that stuff on TV. They don't really understand why it's been done. <laughs> I think that's what Mo said. Mo said, a lot of these guys watch too much TV, you know, come to the ride and do what they saw on TV, but don't know why they're doing it. <laughs> so you let people have their fun. As long as it's safe, let them do their stuff and just speak with your legs. So I'm keeping the effort. I got my eye on them. I'm just, just about feel, keeping it right around there. Because this is a grade. So we're doing like 18 miles an hour or so almost and i know it's an effort the wind's coming from the right Pedro really should be on the left of michael there a little bit get more of a draft there are a few cracks and crevices patina coming up i'm going to point to them and Pedro's so tired he's going to miss it paul's going to tell him right there <laughs> he actually rode in a crack that's how you know he's tired and that's what we mean when we say you're riding cross-eyed. You're so tired, you can't make those corrections. Well, you can have crashes and other things. That's the time to back off because your fitness is not there. I'm aware where everybody is. I'm watching and just keeping the effort the same, just by feel, just the pressure, keeping that pressure going. We've all been dropped. Every rider worth the salt has been dropped. So don't get worried about it. What's important is that you know why you were dropped. Are you dropped because you just haven't been training much? Fine. Check. Are you dropped because, oh, I don't feel like doing this today. Check. If you don't know why, then it's, your pro it's a problem. And it's a problem for only you. The guys are in the distance, we can see them. They are just barely getting up that hill up there. Uh, they're kind of small on film, but we can see them visually. 
the road goes up to like three percent here it's gonna be really hard for pedro you're gonna see him have to let us go and paul will stay with him so paul is gonna be the gatekeeper here i get on michael's wheel there so paul's encouraging pedro well, paul told him we're almost there so we're gonna turn And it may not seem like much. I mean, we're right there, he can see us, but when you're dying, that might as well be two miles. Paul's okay, gonna get in front of you. Okay. Paul tells him we're gonna get in front of you just to give him a wheel to follow. Now, I'm aware they're back there. I can see them in my mirror. And so what I'm gonna do is, as we ride, as we go over these hills, I'm in a little bit, I'm gonna edit for time. As we go over these hills, I'm gonna make sure they can always see me. Because having a visual object encourages you to keep pushing. That's the same thing where if you break away from the group and they can see you, they're most likely to try to catch you when you're within sight than when you're out of sight. Our effort up front has not changed. It's just the terrain has changed, so we're going faster. We're going down the hill about 50K. I edited for time here. That's me you're seeing. The guys are just a little in front of me. I, they're right there, maybe a car length or so, but I'm hanging a little back so Paul and them can see me the whole time. We're going to be turning, so I don't know that we're going to regroup at this point. I don't know, but once we turn over there, you can see there's a rider okay. going across. I'm still on the highway. I, I hung back so they can see me. We're going to be turning left. That's Keenan Cutoff Road. And when you're tired, this highway is not where you want to be on because it's up and down. It's a lump. I'm still in the left lane there. That's me. The guys have already turned. But I stayed there just to give these guys something to see. That's me turning. And now we're back to real time. The editing is done. So there's a car. Paul's letting him know. I'm already on that road. I'm going very slowly because I really didn't expect them to Easy. stop. All right. But they've pulled into that parking lot on the right, the gas station. They're standing on the left because we're not we don't need anything from the gas station. They're standing on the left. I'm up the road here where you see that car coming from. Paul's going to call out to me because I, I thought they would just clip back in so we can go. And I'll let you just experience the rest. But make sure you get the doctor's fire. Keep getting your K's in as you listen to Android. how we regroup. It's going to take a break. Take a break, man. So Pedro said, from here I know my way home. Basically what he's saying is, I'm tired. Don't wait for me. Because they don't like to wait anyway. And you know, I think that's fine. Because he needs to chill and ride back in. He's been traveling. He hasn't been training his regular stuff. So that comment that James made about, we're not going to let you off that easy. James is not very much connected to, you know, what an understanding of what... It's going on. Going so he's asking if we're going through the neighborhood or whatever, the route. But really, yeah, he ended up just letting us go. He just simply could not hold the pace. You know, once the legs go, that's it. So they're talking about how many miles are left. So keep getting your K's in. And if this happens to you, let the group go and spin in and enjoy the rest of the ride.